All right, welcome to the new JFK show number 234. We have a special guest tonight, David Knight, and he's going to be knighted as our guide and uh, I guess researcher and videographer. So anyway, David, go ahead and take the show. I understand you. This is a presentation that you recently gave in Illinois. Yeah, it sure is. I, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, and uh, thank you, Jim and Gary and Larry, uh, for having me on your show. It's it's a it's a real honor. Hey, well, we're very pleased to have you here, David. We've yeah, heard. I, 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 uh, I'm sorry, Jim. I didn't want to go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Larry. I, yeah, no, I, I'm uh, very honored to uh, bring David, you know, into the fold here, you know, as a contributor to our show, which has been going on for. Uh, so many years now it seems like forever you know uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah and uh it's not it's not we can't call it the new jfk show anymore jim you know it's like you know we gotta uh, uh change the name a little bit but anyway uh no, it's, last, it's a search engine it's a search engine thing yeah you know yeah. last uh last time well, we, it's it's the show that's doing the cutting edge so what we're doing is new so i think it's fine we can stay with it new research with comes from here Right. So anyway, uh, I just want to segue uh, to David's uh, presentation by saying that uh, I, I, we presented uh, my blog post uh, in, our, in our last show, and I presented a lot of the stuff that David you know, is going to present here tonight, but I wanted Dave to do his original presentation, the one that he did at the only conference uh, for the Jeffy Historical Group, all right, and, uh, which I thought was magnificent. And, and uh, I, I want to say that David Denton was uh, very astute in, in bringing the, the three, the first three presenters back to back on that morning uh, of, uh, of Friday. Okay, he brought David, he brought Casey. Casey was like, he just, you know, uh, that was unbelievable. And brought that. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, it, it's, it was new stuff, a lot of the stuff that uh, these guys presented and they all work together. And uh, that's why, you know, I thought, you know, that we should, you know, give each of them, you know, uh, some time, you know, uh, on successive weeks, you know, so that they can come in and present it and uh, we can uh, bring about their, um, their uh, work, you know, so others can, uh, can see it and give them more exposure the way that they are also going to give us exposure. And I think uh, reciprocating like that, you know, is the right thing to do. Go ahead, Dave. Take it away. Okay, here we go. I get asked the question, so who do you think killed JFK? My answer is always the same. It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what you think. I can give you the road map, but it's up to you to strap in and drive. And I hope after today you'll do just that. Wow, you make history come alive. Thanks, Ted. We're going to make history come alive today. A <laughs> uh, quick word of thanks uh, before I start my presentation. I do want to thank Casey Quinlan for being the first person to open my mind in 1989. Uh, the moment he walked across the stage and threw my school history book in the trash can, I actually started paying attention. Uh, Mom and Dad for buying all my first research materials. Uh, Brian Edwards, of course, uh, for his help and guidance and someone that I've uh, had been able to uh, research with and bounce ideas and theories off of. And also all the eyewitnesses, researchers, and individuals that I've been fortunate enough to interview and speak with over the years. Uh, a little bit about my uh, background. I've been a researcher since 1989. I've read over 400 books. I've read thousands of documents. I've viewed almost every film available. Uh, I've interviewed hundreds of eyewitnesses and people involved in and around the research community. I uh, returned to the scene of the crime over 20 times, made 11 documentaries released on DVD and Blu-ray. I've uh, been a collaborator of other researchers and authors' works, including William Law. Uh, been part of the National Conference in Dallas for the last nine years as a videographer and producer of the conference DVD films, about 200 of them. Uh, I'm also a researcher lecturer, and I'm writing a book that will soon be published. And our topic today is a new theory on the, pres on the throat wound of President Kennedy, possible weapon, ammunition, shooter location, and why. So where'd my info come from? Came from books, videos, testimony, internet, documents, and my direct interviews. So let us begin. We will discuss the weapons that were known for a fact that were in Dealey Plaza on 11 63 We will discuss the weapons in question that could have been in Dealey Plaza on 11 63 And we will discuss what I theorize is the type of weapon that could have been the cause of JFK's throat wound. So let's look at the evidence and my theory. We clearly see JFK's been hit in the throat. Governor Collins shows no sign of being shot in the Zapruder frame 230. 
in the Alkins photograph, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background here. James Williams Alkins took his two famous photographs on November the 22nd, 1963, while working on assignment for the AP. He was supposed to work in the office that day, but instead went to Dealey Plaza with his own camera and captured these two photos known as Alkin 6 on the left and Alkin 7 on the right. And we see a blow up here. Uh, JFK's already reacting to being uh, shot in the throat. Uh, let's look at the picture of the hole in the crack in the windshield. We see the uh, hole in the windshield and several eyewitnesses stated the fact that the, uh, the, size of the, wind, uh, the size of the hole in the windshield was about the size of a number two pencil. Yeah, but David, right there, that's the Secret Service. That's a fake windshield that was presented after. Okay, go right. ahead. I'm good with that. Uh, eyewitnesses uh, say they saw the hole in the windshield and the size of the hole would fit a number two pencil. They also said it was a hole made from the outside going to the inside. Uh, Dr. Evala uh, glanges, but it was very clear it was through and through bolt hole through the windshield of the car from the front to the back. Uh, no way there's even, even any cracks associated with that bullet hole. It seems like a high velocity bullet that had penetrated from the front to the back in the glass pane. George Whitaker Sr. says it was a good clean bullet hole through the screen from the front right. This had a clean round hole in the front and fragmentation out the back. Statements from the men who killed Kennedy. Dallas Motorcycle Patrolman Stavis Ellis, there was a hole in the left front windshield. It was a hole you could put a pencil through it. You could take a regular standard writing pencil, stick it right through there. Dallas Motorcycle Patrolman H.R. Freeman, I was right beside it. I could have touched it. It was a bullet hole. You could tell what it was. Secret Service Agent Charles Taylor Jr., in addition of particular note, was a small hole just left of center in the windshield from what appeared to be bullet fragments were removed. These are from David Lifton's book of best evidence. So eyewitnesses and ear witnesses have spoken and testified what they thought they heard was not gunshots. They thought they heard firecrackers going off. Well, what kind of gun or rifle sounds like a firecracker? I will answer this question with my theory later on. Firecracker. Sounded like a firecracker. These 50 names on, these, uh, on this list, count them, 50 ear witnesses heard what they thought to be a firecracker, uh, such as Jim Darnell, Roy Truly, Jay Malkins, Tom Dillard, Mary Mormon, and so on and so forth. So what did the doctors at Parkland remember seeing concerning the wound in the throat of President Kennedy? And what did the doctors see of the wound at Bethesda Naval Hospital? At Parkland, they saw a perfect round hole, entry wound. Bethesda, they saw a three inch gash, exit wound. Comparison, Parkland's on the left and the Warren Commission drawing is on the right. The back wound, Parkland doctors didn't see this wound, but during the autopsy, the wound in the back was found and probed. Doctors probed the wound and say they could feel the end of the wound with their fingers, so not a very deep wound, surely not a through and through wound. The Warren Commission would have us believe that Oswald shot from an elevated sixth floor, shooting at a downward angle, shot JFK, and the wound turned upright in his body and exited his throat. And how do they explain this theory? With the magic bullet theory. Seven wounds, two people. Uh, this is the picture of the HSCA JFK exhibit with the uh, magic bullet on the left, cotton wadding in the middle uh, to the left, uh, goat carcass breaking one bone, and then the wrist bone of a human cadaver. So we have one bullet that caused all those wounds but came out looking like CE 399. And you know what I call this? It's bullshit. Statements from doctors at Parkland Hospital. Dr. Malcolm Perry, Dr. Charles Crenshaw, and Dr. Robin McClellan. I'm going to show a couple quick video clips of Malcolm Perry and Charles Crenshaw, and then I'll tell you what uh, Robert McClellan told me. At Parkland, Dr. Malcolm Perry, attending surgeon, tried desperately to keep the president alive, but the very urgency of that problem prevented him from examining the two wounds, as he now explains in his first public statement since the report was published. I noted a wound when I came into the room, which was with the right posterior portion of the head. Of course, I did not examine it. Uh, again, there was no time for cursory examinations, and if a patent airway could not be secured and the bleeding could not be controlled, it really made very little difference. Uh, some things must take precedence and priority, and in this instance, uh, the airway and the bleeding must be controlled initially. What about this uh, wound that you observed uh, in, the, uh, in the front of the president's neck? Would you tell me about that? Yes, of course, it was a very cursory examination. Uh, the emergency proceedings at hand necessitated immediate action. There was not time to do more than a, an extremely light examination. Uh, did it occur to you at the time, or did you think, was this an entry wound, or was this an exit wound? Actually, I didn't really give it much thought, and I uh, realized that perhaps it had been better had I have done so. But 
I actually applied my energies and those of us there all did to the problem at hand and I didn't really concern myself too much with how it happened or why and for that reason of course I didn't think about cutting through the wound which of course uh, rendered it uh, inviolate for as regards further examination and inspection but it didn't even occur to me I did what uh, was expedient and what was necessary and I didn't think much about it the nature of the throat wound can no longer be verified, for no records were made and no pictures taken before Dr. Perry cut through it in an attempt to relieve his patient's breathing. The doctors at Parkland were engaged in a desperate struggle to keep the president alive. All else was secondary, but their task was impossible. One of the shots had virtually destroyed the president's head. Even as the doctors worked, the president died. At the hospital, the scene was turbulent and disordered. The press and public were clamoring for news. Dr. Perry was rushed from the emergency room to a news conference where he was badgered into giving a description of the wounds. The neck wound, he told the press, looked like an entry wound, and he pointed to the front of his neck. In the transcript of that news conference, there's no doubt that Dr. Perry made it sound as if he had a firm opinion. The second wound? The second wound was here in the throat, right above the necktie. It was a small opening very small, three to five millimeters, about the size of your little finger. In a slow motion study of the film, President Kennedy grabs his throat with both hands, reacting, Crenshaw believes, as if he is shot from the front. At first, most of the doctors working on the president believe the small neck wound they observed to be an entry wound from the front. Compounding the mystery is this photograph of the government's autopsy, showing a gaping wound in the president's neck. A tracheostomy incision was done at Parkland over the site of the bullet wound. Crenshaw says someone tampered with that wound after he last saw Kennedy's body, making it larger to resemble a bullet exit wound. Look, this is the size of the tracheostomy tube. Mm -hmm. Incision was made and then placed in. This large part, this flange, stays outside. So it was a small wound about the size of the, the instrument uh, that uh, you Right. Saw. An inch to an inch and a half maximum. This wound, and described in the Warren Commission, was almost three inches wide. Double the size. Huh? Double. Is it possible that the doctor uh, working to put this in, what may have been already a bullet wound, uh, made the incision too large? Oh, no. No, Perry was an artist with the blade. He was one of the best trained technical surgeons. And here's what Dr. L. McClellan stated about the uh, throat wound. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. McClellan for the last 10 years. I've seen him lecture and I've recorded him in lecture and I spoke with him at great length. He's been very adamant since 1963 about what he witnessed inside Trauma Room 1 at Parkland Hospital, Dallas, Texas. He states that he saw the back of the president's head blasted out. I asked him back in 2014 about the throat wound, and what he told me is that it appeared to be an entry wound. When I asked him about the size of the wound, and it brought up what I read about what the other doctors had said about it being between three and five millimeter, I asked him what he had observed. Dr. McClellan states that he arrived after the tracheotomy had been performed, but that he was recalling what he and his fellow doctors discussed about the size. He told me that he felt it was a little larger than five millimeters, but definitely smaller than 6.5, which was the size of the ammunition used in a 6.5 Malikur Carcano rifle. I pressed further, how much bigger? And he told me just a little bigger than five millimeters, but definitely smaller than six millimeters. David, David, I think that is a great find, you know, a great uh, relationship that you had with Dr. McClellan and that you were very fortunate to uh, talk to him, you know, so many times about this. You know, the, that's one of the things about uh, what I've said many times about talking to actual witnesses and getting the, the story from people that were there. A absolutely, Larry. Absolutely. Uh, so remember, we are looking for a round of ammunition that's between three to six millimeters and the weapon that could have been used. Well, let's look at the types of ammunition. And on this chart, I want to make a note here. The .17 HMR round at the far left with the X over it was not available in 1963. It wasn't produced until 2002. So what we're looking at is the 22 Hornet or the 22 Long Rifle. So let's look at the handguns, rifles, and shotguns that we see pictured in photographs taken on November 22, 63 in Dealey Plaza. Uh, Dallas Police Department, they were carrying Remington 870 shotguns. We see several photographs here of Dallas PD with shotguns in their hands. Shotgun ammo does not explain the hole in President Kennedy's throat. 
we see rifles being carried into and out of the TSBD while they carry Remington Model 8s. In the photographs just shown, we see Captain Fritz and Detective Boyd carrying their Remington Model 8 rifles in and out of the Texas School Book Depository building. Well, that rifle was chambered in 0 .25, 0 .30, 0 .32, 0 .35, and 300 Savage. All the sizes on the bottom from 6.54 all the way to 9.1 is definitely bigger than the diameter of three to six millimeters. Author researcher Brian Edwards sums up the description of these rifles better than anyone that I know. So thanks to Brian. Captain Fritz and Detective Boyd both carry Remington automatic rifles, same model and caliber used by Clyde Barrow. This rifle is a superior weapon if you're hunting boars and bears. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous to carry that into a building. If they would have had to fire it inside, it would go through everyone and hit the brick wall. I never did understand why they would carry rifles in there anyway. Patrol was already in there searching. So the, the uh, size of those bullets, 6.54, 7.8, 8.2, and 9.1 is too big for the throat wound, so let's rule it out. About the handguns, Sergeant Gerald Jerry Hill carried a 38 Colt Police Positive, Captain Will Fritz, 38 Colt Army Special, uh, Detective Paul Bentley, 38 Smith & Wesson's Model 15 and 10 Snub Nose, while 38 Special is 9.1 millimeters. Dallas Police Motorcycle Officer Bobby Hargis is carrying a 45 ACP, which is 11.5 millimeters in this photograph. And let us not forget about all the other handguns carried by all the other officers. So 9.1, 11.5 is too big for the throat wound, so let's rule those out. Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Bill Decker. Bill Decker was riding in the lead car in the motorcade carrying a Colt Army 1917 Army 45 ACP, which has a size 11.5. He's also riding in the lead car, so I don't think he turned around and shot at President Kennedy in the throat. So 11.5 is too big for the throat wound, so we're gonna rule that one out. Uh, how about the Secret Service? Sir, uh, Secret Service Agent George Hickey, AR-15 rifle. Mm -hmm. Colt Armalite AR-15 model 01 or 601 with a 20 round magazine is a .22 Remington. It is 5.7 millimeters. It fits a throat wound, but the AR-15 wasn't raised up until after the throat shot, and the car, gun, and agent was behind JFK the whole time in the motorcade. So I'm going to rule that one out, too. A key piece of information here for you guys that several researchers have either not known or did not fully research is the 223 Remington round that's been spoken and written about was not even produced until 1964. Nobody had it. So possibly the round that would have been loaded in the AR-15 that Secret Service agent George Hickey had in his weapon that day was a 222 Remington. But just to be thorough, I've included the ballistics of both cartridges of ammo here in this presentation. On the left, you've got the 222 in the center, the 223, and the right is a 22 Remington Magnum. All these bullets are still 5.7 millimeters, but like I say, he was behind Kennedy. How about Lee Harvey Oswald? Backyard photograph holding the Malachar Carcano with the uh, uh, weapon of the uh, revolver on his hip. And here's a Klein's Western store ad. Uh, showing the uh, 6.5 uh, Italian car, uh, carbine. Here we see the uh, Manicar Carcano on display. Well, that one there is 6.80 millimeters. We see here in exhibit uh, 141, FBI exhibit C8. 6.80 is too big for the throat wound, so we're going to rule that one out too. Oswald's revolver was a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson, 9.1 millimeters. 9.1 is too big for the throat wound, plus Oswald had to pick it up from his boarding house after he left this, the TSBD, so we're going to rule that one out. See a pattern catching on here? We're ruling out a lot of guns. Jack Ruby, November 24, 1963, Ruby shoots Oswald. Jack Ruby's revolver, 38 caliber Colt Cobra, 9.1 millimeters. 9.1 is too big for the throat wound, and newly released documents show that Ruby was in fact in Dealey Plaza at the corner of the Postal Annex building across from the TSBD during the assassination, according to informant Bob Vanderslice. 9.1 is too big, so we're going to rule it out. Okay, now that we've got that all cleared up, let's move on. Let us discuss other weapons that we have reports of either being around Dealey Plaza or reported to be seen around or that has been written about in the research documents in the community. Reported two different rifles found on the sixth floor of the TSBD. Time between these announcements that follow uh, is 55 minutes. The reported rifle goes from a 3030 to a British 303 by Tom Whale, an NBC affiliate. A short time later, Dallas Sheriff's officers took a young man into custody. 
It's believed that they also took a rifle at the same time, described as a 30-30 rifle, which was supposedly found near the scene, although this has not been confirmed. We return to station WBAP-TV in Fort Worth and newsman Tom Whalen. Here's an additional report on what you heard NBC correspondent Bob Abernathy describe a few minutes ago, the building in which the sniper had hidden. It's the Texas School Depository at the intersection of Elm and Houston Street in Dallas. Dallas Crime Laboratory Lieutenant J.C. Day went to the building a short time after the uh, shooting took place, and he walked out with a British 303 rifle. The rifle has a telescopic sight. Now, the rifle was found on the sixth floor of the building near a corner window. Also, police searching that area found three empty 303 cartridge cases, also scraps of chicken, as if a person could have been there for some time. There were boxes of books, textbooks, and other school materials stacked up all around on three sides of a sniper's nest, as if he had been there for some time. There was a gun rest made of papers near the open window that commanded the site from uh, which the sniper, uh, from, by which the presidential motorcade passed when the president and Governor Connolly was shot. As we said before, the sniper's nest has been found and police have recovered a British 303 rifle with a telescopic sight. This is Tom Whalen reporting from Texas for NBC from WBAP-TV. These are images of a 3030 rifle. These are not the exact weapons that were there as reported on because we don't have pictures of a 3030 round uh, rifle found that particular type of weapon was never entered into any evidence. We see the 3030 rifle. Well, guess what? That bullet is 7.8 millimeters. 7.8, too big for the throat wound, so we're going to rule that one out too. These are images of a British uh, 303 rifle. Again, these are not the exact weapons that were there as reported on because we don't have pictures of a 303 found, and this particular type of weapon was never enter entered into any evidence. Guess what? The 303 ammunition, 7.92. 7.92 is too big for the throat wound, so we're going to rule it out. Extra tidbit of info. Here you go, Larry. Yeah. Uh, Buell Wesley Frazier owned a 303 British infield rifle. After reports of the 303 on TV, Dallas Police Department went looking for Mr. Frazier. The rifle was not the only reason he was wanted for questioning. Also, his connection to Lee Harvey Oswald, and he, too, worked at the TSBD. He was the first patsy in line. Uh, correct, correct. Uh, supplementary offensive report. Uh, this is dated 11:25:63 uh, by uh, Rose and Stovall. And it says, we received information from uh, Mrs. Bill Randall that uh, her brother, Buell Wesley Frazier, 19 at the time, same address, took Lee Harvey Oswald to work on the morning of the murder, and that she saw Oswald put a long package in the backseat of her brother's 1954 black Chevrolet four-door. By the way, that's Lenny May Randall. They put Mr. Bill Randall to hide her name, but go ahead. Lenny okay. Um, they basically talk about in here that uh, they uh, – Let's see, we went, uh, they, they go looking for Frazier, and they find him uh, at, at a hospital seeing his father-in-law. Well, they take, um, it says, Frazier's sister, Mrs. Randall, came to the location. We brought Frazier and Mrs. Randall to the homicide office. Affidavit was taken from Mrs. Randall. Frazier was interrogated and run on the polygraph with negative results. Affidavit was then taken from Frazier. Frazier and his sister were returned to Irving on 11 63 Now, Larry, tell me here. Uh, we were just talking about this, and uh, you tell, tell us about the report that they tried to have Frazier sign on. I've heard this story, too, but tell, tell everybody that's listening. Well, well uh, for, first of all, the, uh, the, the mention of uh, David Williams, his stepfather, you know, is just bizarre because uh, Frazier left <clears throat> uh, Huntsville, uh, uh, Texas, to get away from his stepfather, okay? Because he used to beat him up. He used to beat the crap out of him when he used to get drunk. That's why he ends up at Lenny May's house, you know, in Irving, okay? And not, not only that, Frazier disappears for about five and a half hours that day. But, uh, you, you know, going back uh, <clears throat> uh, to, your, to your question here, uh, on the night of November 22nd, uh, Captain Fritz, Will Fritz, tried to make uh, uh, Wesley Frazier sign a confession that he had been involved in some way in the uh, JFK assassination at that time. And this only came out in 2013 when Frazier gave a, an interview to the uh, Sixth Floor Museum 
Stephen Fagan is the one who had uh, had that uh, uh, did that interview, and and it's it's very very uh, surprising where Frazier turned that the entire interview around and started to tell the truth. He started to say, you know, how how nice uh, Lee was, you know, with kids. You know, he started to uh, create a, a persona of Lee that was totally uh, counter, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, c contrary to to what uh, you know it, what had been presented, you know, about Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald. But not only that, he said that that uh, Lee was not uh, was not. Uh, uh, was, uh, was not to blame for the assassination, <clears throat> you know, and uh, so many things that he said that day uh, that Stephen Fagan could not avoid, all right? So, and, and, and one of the things that he said that uh, in that interview was this incident that happened with Captain Fritz, you know, where Fritz, you know, got so mad and red-faced, you know, where he tried to hit him and everything, and then he stormed out of the, uh, in, out of the room, and, uh, and Frazier obviously did not sign, you know, that uh, confession, so... Uh, that's the story. You know, about it. it was just so weird. The whole thing is so weird. Yeah, it, to me, it seems like they were trying to make sure they had a backup plan in case they couldn't frame Oswald. They were going to frame uh, Bill Wesley Frazier. And another, and another tidbit I want to mention, you know, that the supposed polygraph, you know, that he took that night has never surfaced, okay? Right. It disappeared, okay? Right. All right, so uh, go ahead. Okay, so uh, two guns in the TSBD prior to November 22nd, 1963. And uh, Roy Truly's later testimony in the Warren Commission, 7H381 to 382, uh, Mr. Ball asked, do you recall any time you saw any guns in the TSBD building? Uh, Mr. Truly, yes, I did, November 20th, 1963. Uh, Mr. Truly says they belong to Mr. Warren Castor, a rifle to go deer hunting with, and a 22 rifle. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the mysterious 38 in the brown paper bag real quick. There was a 38 snub nose revolver found in a brown paper lunch sack. Uh, the revolver serial number was 893265. There's been reports of it being found in front of the, the uh, uh, Texas School Depository Building, the Grassy Knoll, and the corner of Ross and Lamar Street. Uh, reports of a blonde haired woman dropping it, found by Willie Flat and turned into Dallas Robbery Homicide Office by DPD Patrolman Jay Raz. The FBI started an investigation on 113063. Well, where did the investigation lead to? Where's the revolver now? It's clouded in mystery. We don't have a definitive answer on this. Uh, we see here in these uh, uh, Google images of, um, of uh, Google Maps, the uh, Texas School Depository building is only a six minute walking distance to uh, North Lamar Street and Ross Avenue where the, uh, where the gun officially wound up at and was turned into RAS. Uh, let's, let's talk about the 7.65 German Mauser that uh, was reported that they, they found that as well. It's 7.94 millimeters. In uh, Jim Garrison's On Trail of the Assassinations, page 113 to 115, Officer Seymour Weitzman, part of the Dallas Police Search Team, later described the discovery of the rifle on the afternoon of November 22nd. He stated it had been so well hidden under boxes of books that the officers stumbled over it many times before they found it. I don't know if they were Keystone cops or what, but Officer Weitzman, who had an engineering degree, also operated a sporting goods store, was recognized as an authority on weapons, Consequently, Dallas Homicide Chief Will Fritz, who was on the scene, asked him to make of the rifle. Weitzman identified it as 7.65 Mauser, a highly accurate German-made weapon, definitely more accurate than the, uh, than the Carcano. Uh, Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig was also there and later recalled the word Mauser inscribed in the middle of the gun. Well, you're not going to find Mauser on, a, on, the, on the Carcano rifle. Uh, uh, Deputy Sheriff Eugene Boone executed a sworn affidavit in which he described the rifle as a Mauser. As late as midnight, November 22nd, Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade himself told the media that the weapon found was a Mauser. You know something, David? I can't help but uh, notice that the first three weapons were from three different European countries, okay? Correct. You're talking about England, Germany, okay? British, uh, 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 Italy, you know, so, you know, what's going on here? Yeah, de definitely, you know, other than the uh, 3030, you know, well, they didn't have an American-made rifle on scene. So I, I guess they were they were pushing that out towards our, our allies or, you know, out in the, uh, the uh, Very you know, sheriff area. Very interesting. Uh, so 7.94 is too big for the throat wound, so we're going to rule that one out. Uh, let's, <laughs> James Files here. Mm -hmm. uh, James Files, he claims uh, – his real name is James Sutton, 21 years old at the time, on 1122. 
He was a shooter on the grassy knoll, bit the bullet case and set it on the fence. He said that was his trademark. And he says he fired the fatal round into JFK's head. He worked with Charles Nicoletti and Johnny Rosselli, met up with Lee Harvey Oswald and spent time with him in Dallas prior to the assassination. There's more to his story and claims that I'll not go into here, but if you wish, you can look him up on the internet and judge for yourself. Uh, he claims uh, his, his uh, choice of weapon was the Remington XP-100. Now, this is a 221 Remington Fireball, and it is 5.7. Well, let's talk about that 5.7. It fits the throat wound, but Files himself said he only shot Kennedy in the head, not the throat. He fired one round, hit him in the head. So we're going to rule it out. And finally, we have come to my theory of what type of weapon could have been used. Art imitating life. Let's see if Hollywood and one of its timeless films could point to a weapon that could have been used. James Bond from Russia with Love, uh, Ian Fleming's uh, film. Uh, where does he get those wonderful toys? Ask the equipment officer to come in, please. Q Branch has put together a smart looking piece of luggage for us. We're issuing this to all 00 personnel. An ordinary black leather case with 20 rounds of ammunition here and here. Now, if you take the top off, you'll find the ammunition inside. On the side here, flat throwing knife. Press that button there, and out she comes. Inside the case, you'll find an AR-7 folding sniper's rifle, 0.25 caliber, with an infrared telescopic sight. Excellent stuff here, David. Thank yeah. you, Larry. Uh, from Russia with Love was released October 10th and 11th in 1963 in London and United Kingdom. It wasn't released in the United States until April 8th, 1964. So what would have been like if the shooter that used this or could have used this weapon was sitting there in the theater going, holy shit, that looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Not with that arm, you won't. You'd better leave it to me. I'm already too much in your debt. How can a friend be in debt? for a red lens. Do you notice anything? Not yet. She has a lovely mouth, that Anita. Yes, I see what you mean. A harm or no harm, I have to pull that trigger. Well, if you think you can. You've got one shot, remember? It'll have to do. for the use in the movie and assassination well let's talk about the rifle i think was used the ar-5 and the ar-7 the armalite ar-5 was produced and put into use in 1956 by the united states air force they actually had what was known as an armalite ar-5 and an armalite ar-5a the ar-5a is the one that was actually adopted in uh it was released for civilian use in 1959 it weighed 2.5 pounds the uh, length of the uh, stock was 28 inches, barrel length 14. You got a, you've got a gun length of 42 inches. And here is the uh, bolt action of the uh, uh, receiver. And we see the uh, clip assembled in. They actually used to call this the uh, Ronson clip or the Zippo magazine clip because the five round capacity magazine was about just about the size of, of a Ronson Zippo. The 22 Hornet round, which is what was chambered for the AR-5, is 2.3 times the muzzle velocity and seven times the energy 
of the common 22 long rifle. This is a, um, uh, a supersonic bullet. It's, a, it's got a ballistic tip, like a polymer tip to it. And I've got one here in my hands. You can actually remove the uh, tip of the bullet and it goes down about, uh, about three eighths of an inch. If you wanted to tip the bullet, uh, say with mercury or a poison, you could easily do it by removing it and then just putting a wax seal back on the bullet. Jim, you were asking about this uh, the other night, uh, precisely about the, the tip there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as far as size comparison goes, this is your 22 long rifle, okay? This is your 22 Hornet round. There's only approximately about maybe three quarters of an inch longer, but you've got 2.3 times muzzle velocity and seven times the energy of this little guy right here. Uh, we see size comparison here. It was designed in the 1920s, produced 1930 to present. You can still get the 22 Hornet round. There's other rifles out there besides the AR-5 that uh, will fire this ammunition. If you want to buy an AR-5 today, you got to find a gun broker that can locate one, and they're ranging about between $2,500 and $3,000 for that rifle. Uh, it's manufactured by Winchester and used by the United States Air Force in World's, uh, World War II. Specifications, 5.7 millimeters. Uh, 35 grain round, which is your VMAX round like this, is 3,060 feet per second, 728 foot pounds. More than enough to go through the windshield and cause the, the, cause the wound in the throat of President Kennedy. So 5.7 millimeter fits the throat wound, so let's rule it in. Now we're going to see the Armalite AR-7, which is the standard 22 round. It was produced and used in 1959 to present. Uh, it weighs 2.49 pounds, barrel length 14 inches, total length, it's actually 35. I made a mistake in, I, of saying it's 28. Uh, original, it was five round capacity. Now you can put eight rounds in this gun. Uh, we see the 22 long rifle size here. Uh, that's also 5.7, but if you look at velocity, it's only 1,200 feet per second and 104 foot pounds. So I don't think it was the AR-7 rifle. I believe it was the AR-5 that was actually used. Uh, 5.7 millimeter for the AR-7 fits the throat wound, so we're going to rule that in as well. Uh, Henry Survival now makes the, uh, the rifle. Uh, it's made from the design of the Armalite AR-7 and the AR-5. Uh, weight is three and a half pounds. Uh, I measured it, and the uh, total length of it is actually 35 inches. This is completely broken down, uh, and we're going we're gonna to put that together. Pull off your buttstock. You know. <laughs> There's your magazine. This is your action. Your action goes down and slides in. There's a there's a set screw right here that puts this together. Looks like a toy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> a James Bond toy. Yeah, really. And then here's your barrel. It just slides down, and then you've got a spin collar. So the total length of the rifle mm -hmm. is 35 inches. It's easily put together. You can take it apart. You can, uh, well, you can ask Larry. I walked up on the stage, yeah, and I had it in my uh, sport coat, and I took it out and uh, – Put it out, put it down by the podium, and then I gave everybody a little disclaimer. I was going to show it, and I asked him. I said, uh, "Do you?" I walked out in the middle. I said, "Do you see anything, you know, weird that I'm? I have any bulges on me?" And uh, I said, "Do you see a rifle anywhere on my person?" And of course, nobody could see it. Well, I reached in my coat, I pulled it out, put it together, and those are the pictures that uh, Larry showed uh, last week, and also on his blog. And when people saw it go together, they were just completely blown away on how easily it was to conceal. Yeah, if they were gonna put anything under your armpit, like Lee was supposed to do, 
Yeah, that would have been the rifle, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this would have been a so much easier deal than. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Five Carcano rifle. <laughs> and uh, here's a picture of uh, when really? if you buy a Henry survival rifle today, you can get these at any place: Bass Pro, Academy Sports, damn near anywhere. You can order them online. They're two hundred forty nine ninety nine for this particular rifle. Uh, two magazines, the barrel and the action and the stock all come together. And it, uh, here, here's a good one for you. If you drop it while you're hiking, the damn thing floats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, you were, we, were, we were talking about a, a, a scope on the rifle. This, this here is a picture of the scope mounted on top of the rifle. You can order the adapter online for $24.99 uh, that has the threads on it so you can put an actual uh, suppressor on it. Mm -hmm. The AR-5, the AR-7 both could have been used. The AR-5 is the rifle that I lean towards because the 22 Hornet is a more powerful round. Okay, so why? Well, it has very little recoil. It's easy to conceal rifle. It's extremely accurate to 100 meters. For such a small caliber, it can cause a lot of damage. And guess what? It's quiet. It sounds like a firecracker. Uh, Dave, now that you mentioned the 100 meters, uh, I recall that Brian did that uh, in his presentation. He was uh, talking about the uh, uh, periphery, you know, the circumference, you know, and how that precise uh, measure that 100 meters came into play in, from the back, from the front, the side and everything, which uh, would have been, you know, the ideal distance for, for an ambush for, uh, for a, a, uh, a sniper. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Larry. What, uh, we, what, we what, hear... do we, what do we estimate the distance from the inside the triple underpass to the... About 90, about 90 yards, 90 meters, something like that. Jim. Yeah, well, well within the range, on, on, on Larry's uh, aspect of putting the uh, shooter in the cubby hole, or where I'll show you where I've got my shooter location, which yeah. is right above Larry's, they're well within that 100 meter range. Yes, yes. Uh, th this sound here is actually what a firecracker sounds like. We've all heard him before. And this is the sound of an AR-5, AR-7 round. Mm -hmm. The sound comparison between firecracker and AR-7, it's point zero seven decibels difference wow I, I, I put it on a spectrograph on the audio from a firecracker to the ar7 round and you've got point zero seven less than a tenth of a decibel yeah you can't tell the difference you can't tell the difference i mean th this by shooting this rifle you know this this coincides with what people heard saying they heard a firecracker uh, it does not sound like a firecracker, the 6.5 round. <clears throat> so now let's look at the possible shooting locations and the trajectories for just a moment. Uh, first off, I think it was a frontal shot, obviously. That's what everybody is stating, the fact that they, uh, they saw in the throat wound, the doctors at Parkland, the eyewitnesses say that they saw a, uh, a hole in the windshield from the front. This is an aerial photo, and the red rectangle represents where the presidential limo was at the time of the shot to President Kennedy's throat. If JFK was sitting in his car, this is the viewpoint of what he would have had. A South Knoll shooter? Sherry Feaster, the author of Enemy of the Truth, stated that she thought the head wound came from the, uh, the front uh, South Knoll location. And she puts a throat shot trajectory of 15 degrees in the same location that I just showed what JFK would have seen at, the, uh, at, at his view in Dealey Plaza on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. And if it came from the south grassy knoll, this would explain the hole in the windshield and the shot to JFK's throat. But I don't think the throat wound came from the south knoll. Sniper's viewpoint from the south knoll, we see here in these, two, in these uh, three pictures, actually. So where do I put a shooter? Look at the bridge. This is the Tom Dillard photograph. And every time that we actually see the photograph in print, uh, we usually see, I'll, I hope you can see my mouse pointer here, but mm -hmm. the middle tail light up is mm -hmm. usually cropped out of a lot of the photographs that we saw printed at that time. Well, when you look at the bridge, and if, I don't know if you guys can see it yet, but let's take a look at the next photograph. This photograph was cleaned up just a little bit, uh, other than just taking the grain out of it. Now what do you see? Mm -hmm. How about now? Mm -hmm. Somebody's crouching there. Hmm. Tactical shooting position, or what I like to call I bent down to tie my shoe position. Well, let's take a look from the shooter's perspective. These were taken just last year. If you're standing in that exact location and you're standing 
straight up in the air, straight up and down, and you're looking, and just so happens there was a car in the right location when I took the photograph. Just about, just about the location, a little bit farther back there. And if you're crouched down between the two concrete uh, pillars, yeah. this is your viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And just for uh, giggles, I went ahead and put a scope on it. If, the, uh, if they were using a scope, this would be a perfect viewpoint. It lines up perfectly with the windshield to go right into JFK's throat. And here's an extra tidbit of information for you to ponder. Do you know who had a government issued AR-5 issued to him and did not return it when his service ended? This blew Larry away. And I, I Jim, I, you, yours and, and Gary's uh, reaction to this was, was priceless last week. General yeah. Curtis LeMay. <clears throat> and in this uh, photograph, we actually see that this AR-5 belonged to General Curtis LeMay. It's even got his, uh, his uh, signature on it in his handwriting. And uh, that little nameplate is actually attached to the AR-5 rifle. Mm -hmm. And we see it here and more up close. Well, you know, it appears to have been an Air Force expert by the name of Jack Lawrence who fired this round. So since he was Air Force, that LeMay would have given him his gun. He would have wanted to do it. He hated JFK. But I Absolutely. think Larry's location inside the triple underpass is superior to up on the on the top because it would have been just too conspicuous inside there you got the perfect place to put it in this too many, too many railroad men yeah it's just right. too, too public it's yeah that's public. where uh, Doug, the weldon that's I, the, like, I like the weapon now i think you haven't quite finished david so i want you to finish yeah. and i got a yeah. couple of comments yeah okay yeah. well when uh when me and larry sit down at oldie and we were discussing this and he showed me what he had in chapter 17 in the book which you know completely blew me away i'm sitting there going this is great this you know we're working in the same area right and uh I, I, what I, what I was talking to Larry about, I said, well, what if we had a person, what if the shooter was down in the cubby hole and we had a radio guy with a walkie talkie up on the bridge or vice versa? Mm -hmm. I said, you've got something definitely, you know, conspicuous there in the Dillard photo. And I really like Larry's work with putting the, the shooter in the cubby hole. I said, so what if they were working together perhaps? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Absolutely. Well, see, if you got an Air Force shooter, and he's concerned about the chain of command using the weapon given to him by the chief of staff of the Air Force is going to, you know, reassure him that what he's doing is what he ought to be doing in relation to his responsibilities as a member of the U.S. military. The, the, also, the uh, position on, atop the uh, triple uh, overpass is also the Doug Weldon position, Jim, that, uh, that you published in uh, Murder in Neely Plaza. Well, I think you nailed the location, Gary, and I think that David has almost certainly nailed the weapon. In fact, I think it fits very nicely. I would observe uh, Jack, uh, Lu Jim Lewis has been going through the south and firing high-velocity rounds through junk cars, and he finds it makes a right, the small white spiral nebula with a dark hole at the center. And at the beginning, of course, you show the cracked windshield, which was a substitute by the Secret Service. The original was taken back to Ford and replaced. Uh, Doug Weldon determined from discussion with the official who had it replaced and had that through and through hole in it. That was a third windshield because Ford put a brand new one on, but the Secret Service had a whole bunch. Bob Livingston discovered that they'd obtained 20. They claimed for target practice, but it was obviously to set up, you know, the fraudulent deception we have here. But what Jim Lewis discovered is when it makes a passage through the windshield, it makes a sound of a firecracker. So you have, you know, potentially two sound, sources of sounds of firecracker, namely from the weapon itself and when the bullet passes through the windshield. I'm wondering whether that strong around wouldn't have gone completely through JFK's neck. Well, I was going to uh, comment on that. First of all, I, I think that uh, the uh, discovery here, the presentation by David, uh, especially revealing the high velocity uh, stop, capability. Stop, stop share, David. Stop share. Okay. Yeah the high velocity capabilities of this type of weapon, okay, and the fact that this uh, lower... Uh, uh, Completely share, stop share, David, because I want to get us all four here. Yeah, sure, uh, do I hit the uh, new share or do I hit... Uh, stop, oh, share oh, share share, okay. Just stop share at the top. The, the, right, the, the fact that this is a small caliber bullet that is not really intended uh, to go through, penetrate and go through uh, an object more than so then to tumble inside 
you know, uh, a uh, the target, okay? And plus, the uh, windshield had to take a lot out of it. Yeah, of course, yeah, but it, but still, it, it it is high enough a velocity and powerful enough to go through that and do the damage that uh, it did. I, I think David might uh, want to comment on that. Yeah, I, I tell you what, I've talked to uh, several ammunition manufacturers. I've talked to several people in law enforcement, and the the consensus is the number one ammunition you do not want to get shot with is a 22 round, whether it's a 22 long rifle or a 22 Hornet round. And the reason for that is, is because when a 22 rifle uh, round, whether it's the Hornet or the uh, the long rifle, or even a 22 Magnum, mm -hmm. anything that's 22, it the, the speed that that bullet is moving, when it enters the body, 99% of the time, what it does is it enters the body, it starts a ricochet effect and starts hitting, uh, you know, uh, tendons, bones, uh, soft tissue. Uh, a lot of people that get shot with a 22, you know, if they're out squirrel hunting or hunting with rabbits and somebody ends up shooting with a 22. I've talked to uh, nurses and also doctors as well. I, matter of fact, I even asked McClellan about this. I said, if you got shot with a 22, I said, will that bullet leave your body? He goes, well, you'll actually have to go in and, and dig to get it out. Well, I got to piecing this together. I said, well, why do we have such a wide gash in the throat wound? instead of a, you know, a perfectly round hole that has been enlarged to uh, yes. put the trach tube in. Yes. They went in and tore that gash in his throat to dig that damn bullet out, is what I think. And I think that coincides with the 22 round bouncing around in there. It, they, didn't just, they didn't just reach in with a pair of forceps and pull out the, mm -hmm. the round. What they did is they had to go down there and fish for it to mm -hmm. find out where it went to. Now, Bob so, Livingston, who is a world authority on the human brain and also an expert on wound ballistics, having supervised an emergency medical hospital for injured Okinawans and Japanese prisoners of war during the Battle of Okinawa, told me he believed the bullet had entered the throat and had fragmented, and a part had gone up and ruptured this tough membrane that covers the cerebellum called the tentorum. And another had gone down into the lung, and we know we have the bruises. And it's the right lung, as I recall, that is bruised from efforts to retract the portion of the bullet there. And I'm just wondering if there's anything in your research that would suggest that account by this guy would be consistent with the weapon and the bullet you're talking about. Well, I tell you what, I feel that's definitely consistent because when uh, the 22 round goes in, uh, you know, it, it, it is known to, uh, to fragment and, you know, a, a solid, a solid piece, you know, I, I'm not saying the 22 Hornet's a magic bullet by any means. I don't think it went in and came out in pristine condition. I think between going through the windshield, going into his throat, uh, I, I feel that it definitely could have fragmented and that could explain why, uh, why they went in and pulled pieces out. The, the enlarged uh, throat wound appears to have uh, originated as follows. Bob Livingston, who actually was a scientific director for two of the National Institutes of Health, located across the stroke from Bethesda Naval Hospital, actually had heard the description of the wound on radio of a small clean puncture wound. He knew it was a wound of entry. So he called over and was put into contact with James Humes. And he talk, Hume said he wasn't listening to the radio because he didn't want to be affected by any reports. But Bob explained how that this had been a wound of entry and therefore the neck had to be carefully dissected. They were cut off by the FBI. He thought it was very odd. Right. Humes would that evening later ask him what it would have looked like if it had been a wound of exit instead of a wound of entry and Bob described it. I believe that Humes used Bob's description to reconstruct the wound to try to make it look like a wound of exit. But that Bob's analysis, which I believe is confirmed by your own observations, is the bullet entered it cleanly and then fragmented and part went up to rupture the tentorium because he explained to me that even the near simultaneous of two shots, say from the back of the head and from the side, and now it may have been two from the left and the right temples actually, that occurred because David Mantic is now inclined to believe there was this third shot to the head, which was fired from the South Knoll, where uh, 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 both Rick Russo and Ed Tatro have photographs of that Knoll shooter, separate photographs. So I've now seen two with the rifle. I believe that this is now consistent and puts all the pieces together. That, that it's inside the triple underpass from which the fire the, the shot was fired 
and that you therefore have two sources of the sound of a firecracker, one from the weapon itself, which as you said, makes the sound of a firecracker, and the other is the bullet passing the windshield, which makes its own sound of a firecracker. I think all this hangs together terribly well, and of course, the sound proximity would have been very close. I mean, that's a high velocity route, or a boom, you know, the firecracker sound would have been almost, you know, better than an echo. I mean, it would have been almost overlapping. Right, a absolutely, Jim. And I tell you what, uh, I gave this presentation in Dallas last year, and uh, Dr. David Mantic was actually sitting in the audience, and he immediately just started. You know, he had a, he had a ton of questions for me, and we sat down and talked about it. And he said, uh, I "I've never seen that that rifle before." And he said, uh, "But the way that your presentation puts it out there," he said, "You, I think you've got something here." And uh, Ed Tatro himself, uh, I, I saw Ed down there in Olney, and yeah, you know, he was. Ed was completely blown away too, and I'm sitting there going, "Well, I, I think I might finally have something here." So. Well, what I like too is that this would be uh, Curtis Lemay's own weapon. You see, which would have given the this guy was an enlisted man. He just happened to be the big best shot in the Air Force. Confidence right. that what he was doing was consistent with his obligation to the chain of command. I mean, he got to work for the automobile dealership that provided all these different makes and models for the motorcade, which was completely anomalous. They're all uniformly black Cadillacs, typically. So the perps would know where everyone was. He only went to work a couple days before. After the shooting, he returned to the dealership all muddy because he made his escape through the sewer system, nauseated, went in and vomiting over what he'd done. So, I mean, I think this all hangs together. And then, of course, he would disappear. But I also like it, you know, in relation to what Jim Lewis said. What, the only fault I would give of your presentation is in the beginning, it's disconcerting. You have the legitimate Alchins. I've got many places where I compare the Alchins, where you can see a close-up, that it's a small white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center. It's where JFK's left ear would be if his left ear were visible, juxtaposed with the Secret Service. That's already an assassination sign. It's clearly not the same. I have much more about it, actually, in, in the great Zapruder film hoax. Okay. I ha because I have Jim Lewis's you know, photograph of one of the vehicles he fired through to see if he could hit a dummy in the back seat. But David, this is excellent work, excellent work. I, I, I think that uh, I think one of the main uh, uh, strengths of uh, David's presentation is the way that he has eliminated all the possibilities, you know, of, of uh, the rifle in the board. Well, it was the following flaw. He, he talked about the fireball, and you said you eliminate it because Miles said he only fired it from there, but it could have been a second fireball fired from another location. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, logic. The, the logic. others based on the size of the wound were, of course, more effective, but I thought it was excellent the way you went through the multiple weapons right. and compared right. the, the, the size of the rounds and all that, David, that was excellent. Dr. Like Fetzer, that would be right up your alley, you know, using logic, you know, to uh, narrow yeah. this down. This is, <laughs> very, this is called argument by elimination. You know, yeah. what are all the uh, alternatives, A or B or C or D, and not A and not B and not C and not D and so forth. It, <laughs> it, it had a very nice logical structure. But you yeah. ought not to be using the crack windshield, which is a fake by the Secret Service, without explaining that this was a substitute done by the Secret Service. You did say, and cited the witnesses who reported it wasn't crack, it was a clear, clean bullet hole, but you should have had a close-up of the, 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 from the Alchins, because you can actually see it. I've blown it up, and I've well, used it. Well, there, there, are, there are pictures of the uh, limo at, uh, at uh, Parkland that show uh, what you're talking about, Jim, and also the recordings of the, uh, of the JFK horsemen, uh, Officer Freeman and Officer Stavis Ellis, you know, where they clearly said it was a whole event yeah. with Nice and neat. No, I know. I'm just saying visually in David's pre presentation when he shows the Secret Service limousine, which is a fake, and mm -hmm. isn't identifying it concurrently as a fake, that is disconcerting to those who know the difference. Right. That's all. This is a form right. matter of the sequence of presentation and right. a, a note, as it were, about what you're doing. But I thought it was excellent, David. It's, and, you know, and, I've and seen a lot and, of presentations. This was certainly one of the better, I think, from uh, of JFK of recent time. I, I, I'm very <clears throat> ecstatic, you know, very pleased to see there are persons of your degree of confidence pursuing these issues. This is, to me, a very right. positive development. Yeah.
We need all the help we can get in the, tr in the truth of the community, no doubt. And you've been our honorary guy tonight. So look, we're going to go ahead and call it. If anybody has anything left to say, well done. Well, uh, yeah, good job, David. And uh, we hope to have you on again real soon. This has been JFK number 234. Just another day on JFK. Another day, another day at the office. Thank, yeah. thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it.